Welcome to Stress-Free IEP. You do not need to do it all alone. With your host, Frances Schefter, Principal of Schefter Law. She streams the show live on Facebook on the last Tuesday of every month at noon Eastern. Get more details and catch prior episodes at www.schefterlaw.com. The Stress-Free IEP video podcast is also posted on YouTube and LinkedIn. And you can listen to episodes through Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and more. Now, here's the host of Stress-Free IEP, Francis Schefter. Hello, listeners, and welcome to the show. Today, I'm going off a little bit from the usual IEP talks and special education services and talking about the you do not need to do it all alone. As we know as parents, it is so difficult, especially as parents with children with special needs. And support is so important for us personally and for our children. So today's guest, Megan Lucas, who is the creator creator of Dear Strong Women and is a life coach and an author, and she's going to help talk to us about how it is so important to not do it all alone. Megan, welcome to the show and please Hi, introduce Frances. yourself. <laughs> yes, thank you so much for having me. As Francis mentioned, uh, my name is Megan Lucas. I'm a life coach. I'm an author. I tend to do scary things. I know a thing or two about doing it alone and have learned and I'm still learning how to not do that and why that's important. And I'm sure we'll dive into that today. Definitely. And I wanted to touch base a little bit on your history to go like kind of where you started and how you got to where you are today. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I got into coaching through being a teacher. My background's actually in education. I taught music, um, believe it or not. Um, I worked in an inner city charter school for eight years, five of those years teaching music, and then another three into, I went into administration, got super burnt out from, in hindsight, doing it all alone, and uh, ventured off into another career path of coaching, So, which is great because it, it reminds me of how I showed up with my kids as a teacher, you know, just holding the mirror, reflecting choices, what's next. Um, but yeah, that's, that's my, my background, both in education and the burnout side of it. Which is so important because teachers and parents get burnt out. Teachers can change careers. Parents, we have a little bit harder time if we yeah. burn out <laughs> and need to get that support. Um, so, and like, I know what a lot of parents, a lot of times I get potential clients calling me or people that I talk with and they talk about how they just, they don't have it anymore. They can't fight anymore. They're just they're just tired of going up against the system. And they're just like, you know what? It is what it is. It's the best I can get and give up. I know that's a big phrase for you. It is what it is. How do you get out of being that? Oh, yeah. Phrase? I mean, it is what it is. Like, I have to really check my feet whenever that's something I want to throw around. I definitely, like, my radar goes off when I hear other people say it. But when I find myself saying it, I'm like, hold on, check yourself. Um, yeah, it is what it is for me is almost like a scapegoat of, all right, well, guess I can't do anything about it. When, if we really check in and, and, and stay in the game, like we probably could do something about it, but maybe not by ourselves. Maybe, maybe this is where we need to bring somebody in to just brainstorm or dump so we can clear out the, all the junk we're carrying in our heads and the exhaustion and the hurt and the, this is so hard. Um, yeah, but really for me, anytime for me when I when I feel tempted to say that and just throw my hands up, it is what it is. That's that's an invitation for me to, to really check in and like, okay, I need support here. And so how can you help support parents that are having that issue and are just done and just saying it is what it is, I don't have it in me anymore? How can sure. you help them find that drive again? Yeah, what I find for parents is that and, and for a lot of us, we are so used to dumping into our people, whether it's work, whether it's our kids, whether it's our friends, that just to have the space to spend to talk about ourselves and what's going on is huge. 
I call it um, dumping our purse. <laughs> so I invite my clients to come, you know, hop on the phone with me and dump their purse. Let's see what's in there. Because sometimes we get so caught up in just doing and the list of tasks and what everybody needs that we're not really aware of like, what we're carrying, what we need. So just having the space to dump and reflect is huge. And a lot of times the thing that feels impossible or heavy or overwhelming, like I just can't do it anymore. It's because we're carrying a whole purse full of rocks and like, you know, things that we haven't unloaded. So being able to do that often gets my clients back in action, back in power. Suddenly they've said something that they're like, well, that's not silly. But in their heads, it sounded really like heavy and significant and, and uh, like, a, like a big block or a hurdle. So it's just, it keeps the conversation going. It's like staying in motion. Um, like when you're grieving, like sometimes you just got to keep moving and yeah. And then what the next step to take kind of presents itself. And you really just need the next step. You don't need the whole plan laid out. Right. No, definitely. I, I so get that. Um, you know, my background a little bit and it's just kind of like, this isn't working for me anymore. What's the next step? And yeah. that's, you know, for me from teaching and I went to law school and it would kind of, I didn't plan on going to law school when I started taking the LSATs, but it just presented itself. And now I'm here and I love what I do, helping and educating families. Um, So I want to talk a little bit about like the difference between coaching and therapy, because I know there's so many people out there now coaching and it's like, well, I don't want to go to a therapist, but that's not what coaching is, is it? Correct. Correct. Thank you for this question. Here's, Here's the great thing about the coaching industry is that anybody can be a coach. It's also the not so great thing is that anybody can be a coach. It's not a regulated profession yet. So something to be mindful of when you see someone say they're a coach, it's just attached their LinkedIn profile or their business card. However, um, that, that being said, the coaching, like the profession of coaching can really work hand in hand with therapy. And, um, when I first hired a coach, I was working with a therapist at the same time. So just to give you a little idea of how they, um, the lanes in which both operate. So therapy is much more of a um, past-based conversation. We're looking at things that have happened in service of perhaps there's some healing to take place before we can move forward. Okay, so I listen for it with my clients. They keep coming up against something that they just can't quite let go of or work through, there's likely something more um, needed there. Now, with coaching, we'll look at the past too, but not from a sense of healing, more so just to identify some patterns. We're much more factual. Um, You know, we're just gathering the data. And we do that in service of breaking up those patterns so that we can start where we're at and move forward. So it's a much more forward-facing conversation. We don't dwell a lot in the past. because it's, you know, a lot of times that's part of like the baggage that we're carrying and not putting down to really propel us forward. So really works in great parallel with a therapist. Like you can do some healing work while you're planning your future, right? So um, yeah, the, just there's some nuances around the language uh, that are a little different. Like therapists will probably be more of, okay, so how does it make you feel? And I'm more like, okay, now what? What's next? What's the choice here? Despite the feelings, we can all do things despite how we're feeling. I think that's how laundry gets done. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Or like what I like to say is you could be afraid, but do it anyway. Yes. Yes. It's so important. I think so many people think if they're afraid, then, then they're not ready, you know, or they have to be fearless before, like it's the confidence. They want to feel confident before they take action, but a lot of times that confidence comes from taking action. So it's, it's a fun little track. And I've heard somebody said that um, if you're not afraid, then you're probably not trying hard enough. You know, you're not yeah. pushing yourself hard enough. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I call it, there's like this fine line where it's the terrible excitement. I'm like anxious and excited. Like I want to like, yes, let's do this and hide in the corner at the same time. It's both. <laughs> Right. And I, you know, I heard that once before about um, anxiety and like, you know, you get the sweaty and the sweaty palms and the heart palpitation and to start thinking of it, not as anxiety, but as excitement Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. your body has the same reaction, but your brain reacts so differently. Yes. Yes. 
So, for sure. um, so like, how do you handle stress? Like, I know you're a new mom, you know, you have your book out, you're promoting your business coaching. What do you do? How do you handle stress? I'll share a little bit how I used to handle it and how I handle it now in case that speaks to people. I mean, I used to just put my nose down and get to work. Like in my mind, getting emotional or mad or whatever about what was going on was just going to waste time and who had time to waste. Like there's stuff to do. (laughs) So, um, and that worked for me until it didn't until part of like what I was carrying with me was a lot of unprocessed emotion. Um, and not even that sometimes when you put your, put your head down and just work, like you're not aware that you're tired. Even if you're doing something you love, you get tired. So, you know, important, important to check in now. What I do is, um, I mean, talk about coming back to the conversation around support. When I'm about to do something, or I can tell I'm about to do something that's just going to require a lot of me, whether it's courage, energy, um, creativity, I intentionally tap into my community. I've got a few friends I call and just say, hey, I just need you to be a mirror for me and reflect me why I'm awesome, why I've got this. Um, you know, sometimes I'll just dump all the fears in my head, which sound really, really dramatic. And then I hear them. But also, you know, it's just it's just a space to get it out um, because carrying that stuff around is is tiring. So I equate it to um, riding a roller coaster. I don't know if anybody's listening or watching is a fan of roller coasters. But when I feel I guess we'll say my fear is kind of trying to talk me out of something. Don't do this. This is going to be hard. Like, why are you wasting your time? Like all that voice. It feels like I'm being dragged to a roller coaster to ride it. You know, like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. So you can imagine that experience and, you know, kind of being forced in the car and strapped in and just holding on, waiting until it's over. When I feel that coming up, I have to flip it in my head to imagine, all right, we're riding this roller coaster and I'm in the front seat and that's when I call a friend and I just imagine I'm on this roller coaster with them and our hands are there and I'm screaming, which is just me dumping like all this stuff I'm afraid of. And what's great is that in five minutes I'm, I'm done and I'm, I'm grounded and I'm reset as opposed to just trying to avoid getting on that roller coaster. Like it's such... It takes up so much energy and mental space that if I just allow myself to be a brat for five minutes, I'm actually pretty good. It's funny that you say, you know, you say that because I remember before marriage and children and all that. And I would like just hit in one of those moods of just not wanting to do anything or being sad or depressed. And I would be like, okay, you know what you got today? You got Saturday, stay in bed, eat the ice cream, be depressed, do whatever you need to do. But tomorrow morning, Sunday, you're getting up and doing it. Yeah. And it's just so important because sometimes you just need that day. Yeah. And when you allow yourself to do it, you're actually like, it's still from a position of power and personal leadership because you're choosing it on purpose rather than you avoid it, you avoid it, you avoid it. And then suddenly like it's, you know, take it. It's more powerful than you. You're having a meltdown while you're picking out mustard in the grocery store. Like it's like, no, if you choose it on purpose, then you're still the one in charge. Right. Yeah. And some people are like, oh, I had a lazy day today. No, you didn't. You had a relaxing day today. Yeah. That's okay. Yes. <laughs> right. And especially as you know, as parents, we so need that, even if it's a couple of hours, just the me time to touch yeah. base. Yeah. yeah, for sure. And you said, so you said that you have a coach. And mm-hmm. so how did that come about that you wound up hiring a coach? Was yeah. that before or after you became a coach? Before, totally before. I had a, and this might be true for a number of people, like I definitely had a preconceived notion about life coaching. And um, what is this? And um, how I ended up working with a coach is a friend of mine was training to become a coach and a life coach. And she reached out to me to see if I wanted to do a sample session with her. And my understanding of coaching at the time was that they were going to tell me how to live my life. And she was the kind of friend that I didn't want her telling me how to live my life. And my um, skills with boundaries and saying no at the time were not great. So, of course, I said, well, I think we're too close of friends. That might be weird. Do you have someone else in your cohort who's training? Let me hop on the phone with a stranger and tell them about why my life sucks. You know, give my mom a break. 
<laughs> and so this was in my, what ended up being my final year of teaching. It was actually mm, close to this time, probably December of that year. And um, I hopped on the phone with this unsuspecting stranger and dumped my resentment filled purse um, complaints, like all the reasons why I was burnt out and why I had to be because nobody knew how to do their job, like just really a great conversation. And she was so validating and heard me. And um, then she asked me, she goes, okay, I hear you. So what do you want? I'm like this. She didn't hear me. I can't, obviously, I can't want anything. Didn't she just hear everything I just said? And she wouldn't let me off the phone without answering that question. And it was the first time in years of me venting, like to my teacher friends, like where I actually felt better afterwards. Because I had a plan. I had something. I had an action to take. And I got connected to something outside of what I was currently experiencing. So I ended up working with her for a year. And the things that we accomplished in that year alone, including getting out of teaching, I paid off debt, which I didn't know how I did when I was paying her money. Um, just lots of little wins in a short amount of time. I came to her a year later and said, how do I do what you do? So that's when I started training to become a coach. Awesome. Because yeah. it's empowering. And I love that. It's like, you say we did it all, but in reality, you did it all. All yeah. the changes. <laughs> and she just helped guide you. She was just a mirror. Yeah. She just reflected what I said a lot of times, held, you know, held the mirror, asked me some questions to really uh, get me clear on where I was choosing from. Like if I was choosing from a place of fear and just wanting to stay safe, or I was actually allowing myself to dream a big dream and do it the way I wanted to. And you know, there's, there's achieving the goal and then the experience of going for it that are both important, the journey and the destination. Thanks Pinterest. Right. Um, you know, it all matters. So she really helped me find my own answers for those questions. It's interesting you say that because I have a business coach that just does law firms and, you know, she says all the time, it's that fear that's trying to keep you from doing something that keeps you small, Yeah, you know, and doesn't get you what you truly want because it's mm -hmm. just your inner child is going to protect yourself. Yes. Yes. And it's like, you can do this. You can do this. You're okay. <laughs> yeah. And then you said about, um, about going back and um, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> the, thinking about just when you're scared and you're afraid and dumping everything and yeah. just complaining and kind of like, okay, so you're complaining about it. And I know for me, like when my friends or husband or children complain about something, well, what are you going to do about it? You know, it's like, yeah. what do you mean? What am I going to do? Well, don't yeah. complain to me. Well, right? and the great thing about complaints, if, if you can hear it while you're on the receiving end of it, or if you can hear it while you're dumping them, is that inside complaints, there's actually a request in there. There's something that's needed. And usually it comes out as a complaint with a little edge on it because we've gone too long without asking for what we need. So, you know, talk about not doing it alone. If, if, you've, not, if you've not gotten support or if you've done it alone for a while, likely you know, there's some complaints that have built up. There's some resentment that's built up. There's, I shouldn't have to ask for help. They should know what to do. You know, all the shoulds. Beware when that starts coming out. It's, you've already waited too long to ask for what you need. My grandma used to say, shoulda, coulda, woulda. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and then, you know, it's just, it's, people aren't mind readers. But I know, like, I know for me growing up, it was, you know, kind of we're expected to do it our own. You know what right. I mean? Like asking for help was a sign of weakness. Yeah. Yeah. I think, thank goodness. I think that's a narrative that's starting to change. I think we're right in like the gooey middle transition of it. I don't know how long it's going to take, but yeah, if asking for help, I had to, I had to really unpack that. Um, yeah. Where I thought asking for help meant that I was weak because I couldn't do it alone. And what I found when I opened up and said, Hey, I'm not okay. I don't have it all together. If you think about it, doing that is actually a really brave thing. That requires strength. Like it's actually the opposite of weakness to admit, hey, I don't have all the answers. To admit, I need more time. Like you're admitting that you're a human being <laughs> and not a machine. And I think 
as a society and, and you know just over the years we've we've trained ourselves that our we're only as good as our output and right. what we do so you know i love that this narrative is starting to change it's like the mental health space is growing like there's so many there's such an impact from operating that way it's possible you can have a successful life you can you can reach the goals but what's your experience in doing so and once you get there are you excited are you celebrating are you tired or are you not even present to what you've accomplished because you're already looking at the next thing on the list because that's the that's what you're used to so yeah yeah and it's um you know i'm remembering a lot of clients i've had or people that I've talked to and moms with kids with disabilities talk so often about how um, they're just afraid and there's just too much and they can't do it all. And they're so stressed walking into an IEP meeting and they mm -hmm. get emotional. And so I always tell them like, hey, look, I do this for a living and I help all of you do this. But when it comes to my own child and walking into her IEP meeting, I get emotional. Yeah, I get stressed because it's normal yes. to be a parent. It's okay yes um, you know this is we're talking about your child here and and it's a lot of emotions going through with my child's not perfect the child my child's not going to have that future that i envisioned mm -hmm. and it's kind of i'm assuming you can help people find like okay but let's look at it this way of what your child can accomplish right right and a lot of times when when those fears are running amok it you know, we're, we're just making stuff up that's going to support that fear. So not that we shouldn't be afraid and not that we're not going to worry, right? Like that's just a normal part of being a human, being a parent, caring for, for someone. Um, but yeah, if we can recognize that those aren't facts, then it can get us back into power. Yeah, so important. And then I want to talk about because I know a lot of people like, oh, coaching and you said yourself, it's not a regulated business. So can you go into your training a little bit? Because I want to show like yeah. why you are what somebody's looking for, you know, a coach that has this training. Yeah, for sure. And sorry, I've got a little bit of a cough. <laughs> I'm trying not to cough. <coughs> not a machine, not perfect. Um, yeah, so my training, I was trained by an organization called Accomplishment Coaching. Um, they are a accredited coaching, coach training program, meaning there's an overarching, um, <coughs> an overarching uh, regulating body called the International Coaching Federation. So if you're going to hire a coach, check in to see if your coach was trained, one, and it, two, kind of where that training falls on the spectrum. Um, so yeah, so one when, when the business does become regulated, I'm good. Um, yeah, it was an extensive training. It was um, it was a year of um, of training. There were um, we had full weekends of just different modules that we dove into. I was with a cohort. Talk about not doing it alone. Don't train to become a coach alone. Um, and so, and through that, I had a coach. So me supporting clients, I can only support them as far as me doing the work myself. So I had a coach throughout all of that. Um, yes, there were training weekends, but we were also training throughout the entire month, um, learning different tools to support clients with um, distinctions, like ways to, to help them see different things, doing our own work, reading lists, tons of things. And then um, after a year of doing so, it was a performance evaluation, we had people come in who were um, you know, we got to coach them in the moment we were evaluated and, you know, we've got professional coaches listening in to make sure there's certain things that are happening to make sure that we're letting the client drive the conversation and we're just reflecting questions to kind of, you know, keep them on, on a path, not force them, you know, not, not guide it, but just, okay, what about here? Okay. Now we're going this way. Ask a question, you know, but it's all of their creation. Um, yeah, and then for about a year and a half after that, I actually stayed on with the organization and helped to train more coaches coming in. So oh, cool. tons of learning, tons of learning. It kept my skills sharp. It made it's it's always made me a better coach for my clients. Um, yeah, so it's uh, and I'm still learning. I still stay surrounded by that same cohort. Um, 
one in particular uh, member of that cohort, I talk with her once a week. And, you know, we graduated over two years ago. So, wow. yeah, it's important to keep, um, again, back to the support uh, topic, just keeping people around you and not doing it alone is huge. Right. I love that you say that you went back in teaching because that was like something we used to say all the time. If you understand something, great. Yep. But to truly understand something is to be able to teach it to somebody else. For sure. It's such a different For level. Sure. I can't tell you how often, you know, from that lens to when I'm on the phones with my clients and they're, there's something they're going through, they'll say something or even like even my question to them. Suddenly it'll hit me like, oh, that's the thing I'm working on for myself. So it's it's such a like a cyclical, you know, it's 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 almost like a reverse accountability because them working on the thing that I have to work on it, too. I can't hide under the covers, which I want to sometimes. So and then I want to talk about your book, because okay. I know I heard once that everybody has a book in them um, and I'm like, yeah, I don't know about that, but we'll see. <laughs> so tell me about your book. Sure. So my book came from, you know, I guess we'll tie this back into the the asking for help as a sign of weakness. So years ago, my um, while I was in the middle of doing everything myself and just building a giant chip on my shoulder, um, my grandmother ended up passing away from breast cancer. And I wasn't prepared for how that was going to blow me apart. Um, but when it happened, I realized I couldn't just keep operating the same way I was operating. I actually, I mean, I think it was my my humanity, like my broken heart was reminding me that I'm not a machine. And so as a way to process both my grief and then what I was learning, because I was starting to question what I was doing in my life and how I was doing it. Um, I went to writing. I was always like, I loved writing when I was a kid. It was something I threw off the list when I started working because who has time to do things for themselves? You know, like the whole, you see where the resentment came from, right? So um, yeah, I started writing as a way to process. And um, in honor of her, I started a blog called Dear Strong Woman, which is where the whole, you know, idea comes from. So I was sometimes writing to her, sometimes writing to myself in the third person, sometimes writing to a friend who maybe has gone through something. And it was a way for me to share out loud what I was going through. And often like that was where I dumped my purse in a way. And um, with that, um, that's where I started to really build a community of people saying, hey, me too. Thank you for saying that. Like huge, huge uh, like support that just came from me showing up messy. Um, so the book is an extension of that. It's like years of me, of all of my writing. I mean, I just took it all like from the blog and some other things I hadn't published and just dumped it. Well, all right, what's the what's the common thread here? What can I what can I pull out of here? And it was great that in that doing so, what I thought the book was going to be and what it ended up being ended up totally different, so just because of the process. Um, but what the book supports people with is, I mean, I share a lot of my personal story and, and really is transforming my life through the lens of, hey, this isn't working. This isn't working. I wasn't really sure what I wanted to go into. I just knew it wasn't what I was doing. And so I walk people through steps to get into action, including one, checking in on what are the defaults you believe about the world and about yourself? I call them default rules, like whether it's like, you know, personal things around, uh, you know, um, your, as we mentioned, your value is only as good as your output. Um, there's things around body image that we might believe, like the skinny you are, the, the, the pretty you are, the more idealized you are, or, um, you know, don't bring up politics, like, like so many different, different rules that we operate under. And so I help people, I ask them the questions to check in. And look at, you know, what what are your beliefs and where are they stopping you? And then from there, I give them the choice. Like, hey, if what you currently believe is working for you, I'm not telling you that it's wrong. Okay? I think there's a lot of that going in the, out in the world. Everyone's <laughs> beliefs are wrong. You choose it, you choose it. But I want you to recognize you're choosing it. It's not maybe the way yeah. it is. Um, 
And if you want to choose something different and explore writing your own rules, putting down what society's told you, what your parents have told you, what your teachers have told you, and actually creating this on your own terms, here's some steps to do so. Here's where to tap in, like building the muscles with listening to your intuition. Maybe we haven't done that in a very long time. Here's what you do whenever there's all these voices coming in, up in your head telling you you're greedy for wanting something more out of life. Here's how you find support. Here's how you, you know, embrace the mess that's about to come your way. So I share a lot of personal experience with how I've done that in hopes that it it uh, supports people. And um, yeah, it's a great it's a great resource for people, I think, at any stage of their life where they're feeling like a transition's coming whether it's happening to them or they need to create it. Um, yeah, and I, I hope it's it's beneficial for people and it gets them into action and actually living the life they want to because life is short. And that's something my grandmother's passing really um, opened my eyes to. Like, I can't keep doing this. I don't have a lot of time here. Right. And it's what first came up with me um, for me is – when parents are first told that their child might have a disability and -hmm. that your child's not perfect. And I remember it's changed a little bit, but way back, it's like, oh, your child has Down syndrome or autism. They're never going to go to college. They're never going to do this. They're never going to do that. And so parents got that defeated feeling Mm -hmm. from the doctors. Mm -hmm. But guess what? That's not true. Yeah. You know, like if you as a parent want your child to do something, you know, find a way there's help out there. There are so many people that can help you get your child to be the best your child can be and happy. Yeah. Even if you have all the evidence that no child has done that before, right? Even if that's what you're, you're carrying, like, well, like, how could it be possible? I don't know. Let's find out versus like going with what's predictable based on what's, gone on for other people or history or, you know, what have you, if you believe there's a chance, play for it. What's the worst that could happen? Right. And I love that. What's the worst that could happen? Like if you sit there and do nothing, then nothing's going to happen. Right. If right. you try, you at least have a 50, 50 chance of changing. Yeah. 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 So important. So your book, the name of your book is you make it's the called, rules. Yeah. You make the rules, how to rewrite the rules you live by so you can live life on your terms. Awesome, and where can people get your book? People can get it on Amazon. Just type in, you make the rules, Megan Lucas, it'll pop up. You can also get it off my website, um, dearstrongwoman.com slash you make the rules, and it takes you to Amazon. So one way one way or the other. And your website, if people wanna get, get in touch with you. Sure, yeah, dearstrongwoman.com is the website. You can go, there's a coaching page, there's a speaking page, I mean, yeah, all everything you need is, is there. Awesome. And then also we're going to have your information in the show notes. If you're watching this, if people are watching on Facebook or LinkedIn or YouTube or listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, I don't even know all of the places, <laughs> um, but your information will also be linked so people can find you. Great. And if you are listening, please remember to hit subscribe or hit like so you can find out more about us. Um, and Megan, thank you so much for coming on my show oh, you're sharing so all of your wisdom. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it was a pleasure. You've been listening to stress-free IEP with your host, Francis Schefter. Remember you do not need to do it all alone. You can reach Francis through schefterlaw.com where prior episodes are also posted. Thank you for your positive reviews comments, and sharing the show with others through YouTube, LinkedIn, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and more.